Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. nation once again went to the polls Friday to elect their sixth president and decide for their country. Jane Saito Ferry has more on this. The eagerly awaited day finally arrived and people lined up to vote to elect the new president. Polls opened in Iran at 9 a.m. on Friday and lines formed at polling stations even before the polls officially opened. Some 46.7 million people were eligible to vote, including Iranians living abroad. The huge turnout came at the end of three weeks of campaigning by the hopefuls. I expect the next president to give priority to our problems and to listen to what we say, she says. Election officials set up more than 41,000 ballot boxes across the country. Another 254 ballot boxes were ready in 102 countries to take the votes. The United States played host to the largest of the 114 constituencies abroad. 300,000 observers oversaw the process, three to five for each polling station. Members of the public have high expectations from the new chief executive. The younger generation, which had a remarkable presence on Friday, is seeking removal of major problems. I've been standing here to vote for three hours, all to save your dirt, to support the Islamic establishment, and to steer our own destiny, regardless of sheer lies by the foreign media, says a student. The result is expected late Saturday or Sunday. If no candidate wins at least 50% plus one vote of all ballots cast, a runoff vote will be expected next Friday. But the important thing today was the support given by the Iranian nation to the Islamic establishment. Say to Firi, Tehran. Just a few minutes into the voting time, leader of the Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, attended a polling station at Imam Khomeini religious site and cast his ballot for the sixth president. In brief remarks after the vote, Ayatollah Khamenei said massive turnout at the polls provides the nation with yet fresh opportunities for the four years to come, adding every single vote in favor of each of the seven candidates is indeed a vote in favor of the Constitution and the Islamic Republic at large. Leader of the Islamic Revolution then hoped the voting will send into power an efficient president and government capable of solving the problems and meeting the needs of the nation. As for the negative propaganda aiming to undermine the election process, the leader said the enemies are at pains to prevent the Islamic Republic from being established as a successful role model for religious democracy in the region and the whole world. President Mohammad Khatami too voted to elect Iran's next president as a replacement for himself. After casting his ballot, President Khatami said election symbolizes democracy and hoped the huge turnout of the Iranians in, in and outside of the country will pave the way for the establishment of a religious democracy, a major objective by the Islamic Republic. The outgoing President Khatami also said holding elections is a great achievement attained by Iran, no matter what the result will be. The chief executive then pointed to anti-Iranian propaganda by the outsiders and said the public turnout has formed the plots hatched by the sworn enemies of the Islamic establishment. 
Elsewhere, in his remarks, President Khatami appreciated the efforts made by the government and mass media on the June the 17th polls. First-timers also went to the polls to elect a new president for Iran. Let's see what they have to say. احساس کردم که وقتی می گذارم من هم مثل بقیه در اداره کشورم سحیم شدم و آینده خودم ساختم خوب خوشحالم می توانم برای سرنوشت کشورم دخیل باشم توی سرنوشت کشورم و می توانم که توی انتخاب آیندم سحیم باشم Iranians abroad too joined their fellow citizens in voting for their upcoming president Welcome to the news. The Iranian Foreign Minister Abdul Wahad Al Musalwari announced that the presidential elections period will be expanded for an extra hour until 10 p.m. Iran time. This comes after the elections were earlier prolonged for two hours due to the overwhelming crowds at the election polls. It is expected that the results of the elections will be announced tomorrow at 8 in the evening. On the first day of the presidential elections, these doors, which opened for a second time due to the high competition, and after the election period was expanded for two hours, welcomed even more voters to the voting booths. This will be the first time that there will be a second round of voting in the presidential elections in the Islamic Republic's history, because it will be difficult for any of the seven candidates to win a majority of votes in the first round. Predictions about the results of the elections by officials and candidates say that participation in the elections is good, something which is contrary to expectations, especially after a large number of candidates and political activists announced a boycott during the election campaigns. As the voters in Tehran waited in long lines at the voting polls, the current president of Iran whose term has ended, Mohammad Khatami, after voting at a voting booth in the Interior Ministry, said that there's a possibility that a president will be elected and that the Iranian people are known to go beyond expectations. This was also echoed by the candidate Akbar Hashemi Rastanjani after he voted in Tehran, saying that some of the polls indicate that a president will be elected in the first round, expressing his hope to win. The reform candidate Mustafa Ma'in, after voting, said he expected that a president would be elected in the first round saying that he hopes that voter participation will reach 60 or 70 percent. Mohammad Reza Khatami, the president of Iran, said that he expects that Mo'ayin will be among the two candidates in the second round if a president is not elected in the first round. According to the latest opinion polls, Rafsanjani will win and Mo'ayin will take second place because of the support he received from former Iranian chief of police Mohammad Bakr Talibov. However, one cannot exclude surprises. For example, the mayor of Tehran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, could take second place. Meanwhile, the U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice said that democracy in Iran is moving backwards. The Iranian Foreign Secretary Kamal Kharizi responded by saying that the Bush administration says it promotes democracy. However, it ignores real democracy in Iran and also works against it. The White House spokesman said that the American administration is opposed to setting a timetable for the withdrawal of American forces from Iraq. Meanwhile, the U.S. also announced that they have arrested Abu Talha, the leader of an al-Qaeda organization in Mosul. Also, earlier, the American army issued a statement saying that six American soldiers were killed in Ramadi. Meanwhile, Iraqi security forces continue being targeted and more bodies were found in several areas of Iraq. At the 
the political level, an agreement was reached to increase the number of Sunni seats in the Constitution Drafting Committee. Iraqi mothers crying over their killed children is now a daily occurrence. Today, three children were killed when mortar shells landed from an unknown source on one residential neighborhood in Baghdad. No one has claimed responsibility for this shelling and no one knows where the missiles came from. Six security officers from a unit, known as the Maintaining Order Unit, which works under the command of the Ministry of Interior, were also killed. In addition, 25 others were injured by a suicide attack that targeted their convoy. Several operations targeted Iraqi security forces in Samara, al and BG, killing four soldiers. Explosion and attacks happen in Kirkuk on a daily basis. Eight Iraqi soldiers were injured when a booby-trapped car exploded as their convoy was passing. This incident comes only hours after 21 city employees were killed. Security measures must be strong and decisive in neighboring districts. The Interior and Defense Ministry will coordinate these measures. More Iraqi bodies were found, and the latest of which were found in Latifia near Baghdad. The victims were either beheaded or shot to death. Armed individuals raided a home in the Sandiji area and took the father and his four sons outside to kill them. Meanwhile, the Al-Qaeda organization in the land of the two rivers extended the deadline set to kill 36 Iraqi soldiers in 72 hours and again demanded the release of female Iraqi prisoners. In Al Mosul, another Another judge was shot to death while he was on his way to war. He is the third judge to be killed in the city. Also, a former Ba'ath member was assassinated in Karbala city after he returned to Iraq from abroad. Tension rose in Ramadi after the killing of five American soldiers by an explosive device that went off under their vehicle. Iraqi and multinational forces were deployed to the area in response. Armed men shot another American soldier to death during confrontations and home raiding operations in the area. As security operations continue in Iraq, Iraqi officials announced the possibility for an amnesty for rebellion forces that hand over their weapons and participate in the political process. At the political level, an agreement was reached to increase the number of Sunni seats in the Constitution Drafting Committee from 2 to 25. And Iraqis are looking forward to the participation of a large formal Iraqi delegation in the International Brussels Conference, which aims at rebuilding Iraq and its official and security institutions. United States aircraft and ground troops launched heavy attacks on the Iraqi insurgents today near the city of Qaim, near the Syrian border. Captain Jeffrey Paul of the United States Marines said in a statement from Ramadi, capital of the surrounding Amber region, that Iraqi troops and U.S. tank and amphibious assault unit were involved. Residents in Karabila, a suburb of Qaim, said fierce gun battles broke out overnight and continued. United States forces said airstrikes killed 40 fighters near there on June 11. The chief doctor at Qaim Hospital said six dead bodies had been brought to the morgue today, including one of a woman. Meanwhile, a suicide car bomber blew up his vehicle as an Iraqi army patrol was passing in front of a mosque in Baghdad today, destroying vehicles but causing few casualties. The attack occurred near a mosque in the Kamalia district in the east of the city. In another incident, a car bomb attack today against an army patrol at Toz Khormatou, uh, north of Baghdad, wounded three soldiers and eight civilians. Japanese Prime Minister Joni Chiro Koizumi on Friday urged Iraq to build a democratic framework, saying Tokyo's experience showed that bitter war with the United States can change into friendship. Koizumi said that after meeting with Iraqi parliamentary speaker Hajim al Hassani, al Hassani on his first foreign trip since the historic January 30th election to attend the seminary in Tokyo on the drafting of Iraq constitution. The closed doors constitutional seminar, which lasts until Wednesday, includes 
experts from Islamic nations in Asia and instructions on the lessons learned by Japan. Al Hassani expressed hope that a draft constitution would be ready by an August 15 deadline despite differences on the basics of the new government. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice leaves Washington today on her first major Middle East trip seeking to boost momentum for United States efforts to bring peace and democratic reforms to the region. Rice will visit the West Bank, Jerusalem, Jordan, Egypt and Saudi Arabia before stopping in Brussels for a conference on Iraq and London for a meeting of the group of eight industrial powers. The six-day journey will hit the pillars of United States Middle East policy from the quest for Israeli-Palestinian peace to the drive to stabilize Iraq and nurture reforms in Arab so states. Yes, we need to have patience, but uh, yes, we also. A NATO delegation met the Palestinian Authority for the first time in Ramallah, West Bank, a new step which the Western Alliance insisted did not mean it was seeking a security role in the Middle East peacemaking. NATO delegation head Ed Cronenberg said after talks with the Palestinian Foreign Minister Nasser al Kidwa, the purpose of the visit was to establish communications with the Palestinian authorities and the other aim of the meeting was to inform the Minister about current NATO policies. Cronenberg also held talks later with Palestinian chief negotiator Saeber Akhat in the West Bank city of Jericho. And the purpose of uh, this uh, visit was to establish uh, communications with the Palestinian authorities and uh, the other uh, aim of the meeting was to inform uh, the minister about uh, current uh, NATO policies. Uh, I think on both accounts it's been a successful uh, visit. This is Contrary to what many people have said about NATO role, peace process and so on, this is a modest beginning of a dialogue that we requested. President Bashar al-Assad has committed to working with the United Nations and all parties to implement fully Security Council Resolution 1559 on its pullout from Lebanon. In a meeting with the press, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan said the Syrian president had relayed that to his special envoy on implementing the resolution, Terry Rod Larson. Annan dispatched Rod Larson to Damascus last week to meet with Assad and bring a message. More in this report. UN Chief Kofi Annan said the message from the world body urged Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to cooperate fully with implementation of Resolution 1559. The resolution, adopted in September 2004, calls for the pullout of Syrian troops from Lebanon. The withdrawal was monitored by a UN commission, which said it was difficult to determine whether Syrian intelligence had left the country, given its covert nature. Anand said Larson did get the assurance Syria was prepared to work with the international community to fully implement 1559. He stressed they were going to maintain the engagement. Speaking to reporters, Anand urged all parties involved to fully implement 1559. The resolution calls for a complete withdrawal of Syrian forces from Lebanon and the disarmament of Hezbollah and Palestinian armed factions in Lebanon. Rod Larson was dispatched to Syria last week amid claims some security elements had gone back into Lebanon. Following the recent pullout of Syrian troops. The resolution was very clear from our point of view about the withdrawal of Syrian troops and security forces. And we had um, worked on verifying the withdrawal. Recently, we've been told there were other elements that may have gone back to Lebanon, and the team is there, the verification team is back verifying that. And I hope that uh, at the end of the day, we, we will be able to give a report that will indicate what is happening or not happening. And it is important for all concerned that they respect Resolution 1559. The resolution was co-sponsored by France and the United States, who is maintaining pressure on the Assad regime. Syria reiterated it had fully withdrawn from Lebanon, despite U.S. accusations that intelligence agents remained at the country. Syrian Deputy Foreign Minister Walid al-Muallim called on Washington to start a dialogue with Damascus to resolve long-running tensions, assuring that there are no security or military individuals in Lebanon. He was speaking at the Second Summit of the South, an alliance of 132 developing nations held in Doha, Qatar. President Emile Ahoud was present at the summit. 
Meanwhile, diplomatic sources in Beirut had told the Daily and Nahar the UN was very concerned about information of arms shipment into Lebanon from Syria through the Deir el Asher border region in the north. The UN asked a team to survey the area. There is intense electoral campaigning in North Lebanon for the final phase of legislative elections, which may well determine who holds a majority in the new parliament. The opposition, led by MP-elect Saad Hariri, is urging voters to cast their ballots in favor of opposition tickets, warning against a return of pro syrian figures to the legislature. Voters will choose representatives for two constituencies. The fate of the presidency could also be linked to the outcome of Sunday's ballots. The latest developments in this report. Lebanon is gearing up for the last stage of parliamentary elections in the north on Sunday, with two blocs vying for crucial representation in the country's assembly. General Michel Aoun is allied with pro-Syrian MP Sleiman Frangier against tickets backed by MP-elect Saad Rafi Hariri, the Lebanese forces, the Tripoli bloc and Kornetje Huen opposition factions. The surprise success of the hardline general in Mount Lebanon polls last Sunday dealt a massive blow to the anti-Syrian opposition, which now may not achieve the majority it will need in the 128-member parliament to give it real political clout. 100 seats in Lebanon's House of Representatives, where Muslims and Christians are equally represented, have already been distributed in the first three rounds of voting held free of Syria's 29-year-old grip. As things stand, the anti-Syrian opposition has won 46 seats. The alliance between the Shiite Hezbollah and its former rival, Amal, snatched 33 seats and the Christian Maronite general, 21. The remaining 28 seats will be fought over in northern Lebanon, a predominantly Muslim Sunni area, but with major Christian concentrations. Han will field four candidates on June 19th, three of them on a joint ticket with Frangier, a Christian lawmaker and former interior minister who is a close friend of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. His free patriotic current will face off the opposition coalition led by MP-elect Saad, the son of former Premier Rafi Hariri and his anti-Syrian allies who took all 19 seats contested in the first round of the elections focused on the capital Beirut. Han and Frangier forge a coalition with pro syrian former Premier Omar Karame, who will not run, but has a voice among Tripoli's Muslim Sunni community. Han said he would take the job of president if the parliamentary majority agreed on his goals and on pro syrian President Emil Lahoud stepping down. The opposition is seeking to topple Lahoud, whose mandate was prolonged by three years after Damascus insisted last September that the constitution be amended. The decision can only be reversed if two-thirds of parliament votes for a new amendment to the constitution. Han indicated he was ready to work something out with the opposition to help shorten Lahoud's mandate. Han told AFP and Radio France Internationale he is ready to work on his program with his critic MP Jumblat and Saad Hariri. Jumblat warned that Han's victory would lead Lebanon towards extremism. Either the uh climate of moderation will win or extremism will win we'll see because uh, we need a new lebanon stable lebanon somebody else who came from paris is trying to steal our victory we will not allow him to steal our victory the victory of the people Alan said his program included an independent foreign policy the integration of the lebanese diaspora in decision making and fighting rampant corruption in lebanon Back here at home, the art movement has been growing in Jordan, and different types of art have been evolving too. More galleries are opening, exhibiting the different types of art. One of these new types is creating art through the use of technology, particularly the computer. Alia Tuqan sheds light on one of these technology-based artistic types used by Hayyan Maani, a Jordanian artist who uses computer in his artwork. It is a universal language. It's a way that people express themselves. It is art. Artists create art to communicate their ideas, thoughts, and feelings. They use a variety of methods, which include painting, sculpting, and illustration, utilizing an assortment of materials, including oils, watercolors, acrylics, pen and ink, plaster, and clay. Today, a new form of art is developing through the use of computers. 
From afar, this picture looks like a photograph of His Late Majesty King Hussein. Moving closer, it is more than a standard picture. To create this, the artist used over 15,000 characters from speeches the late king delivered during his reign. Using the computer, each letter in this piece was colored separately to match the original photograph and yet keeping the integrity of each word within the color scheme, thereby creating a symphony that matches colors with words. This piece was created by Hayyan Mani, a young Jordanian artist who uses the computer in developing his work but that isn't the only thing that makes his work different. Showcasing his first exhibition in Amman, Maani, influenced by the Arab culture and heritage, incorporates Arab calligraphy in most of his work. I'm uh, actually very passionate about uh, Arabic calligraphy and I consider it uh, by itself an art. Uh, and we have lots of different uh, types of calligraphy and uh, uh, they are really great. Calligraphy, we usually see it as uh, embroidery in, uh, um, in one or two colors or uh, uh, probably just pink colors. I'm trying to give uh, vibrant and uh, different colors to, to it so it fits um, also the, the modern uh, houses. But the designs and calligraphy are sketched by hand before the final work is completed and then scanned on the computer. But to Mahani, the computer is only a tool. What I do here, I take, the, I, I do lots of sketches and uh, I change and I repeat and uh, and then I, uh, when, when it's final, when I see that uh, they are okay and, and they look nice, then I take them to the computer and uh, and work on them. Although some would argue that the use of technology is easier than the traditional method, this is a laborious, time-consuming technique that only uses a computer to adjust font, size and color. It's really hard to say uh, uh, we can't live without technology. I mean, it's part of our uh, lives, everyday life. So, um, so it has to be, uh, we, we shouldn't be afraid of it. A creative art director by profession and a dental technician by education, Mahani has always had a passion for art, be it through painting, sketching, sculpture, or even furniture design. The pieces he's developed here are completely him, as opposed to the work he does in his professional life, where the outcome is a combination of market forces that leads to a compromise between client and agency. For me here, uh, this is my, it's pure work. This is pure me uh, and this is what I did and uh, no one um, had uh, any say or the color change the colors or uh, do this. The emergence of Arab pop art as a movement with an appreciation of this new type of art in the region is helping to create a group of artists using the Warhol and Herring schools. This group of artists which have embraced computer technology quicker have been the ones working in the more technical media to begin with such as photography, printmaking, and sculpture. As technology of computers becomes more and more mainstreamed into our culture, the number of artists working in digital media is increasing. Alia Tuqan, Jordan Television. The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors, but of the broadcasters themselves. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedahl Foundation and Henry and Virgilia Dakin.